Uh, uh, okay, hang on a second. I have to share my screen. Uh, okay, um, so this is um, a plugin uh, that you can find for Food for Rhino. It's like a joke plugin that I make for April Fools like three years ago. <laughs> It's pretty much impossible to uh, to select a wire with this one. Uh, and you can customize how fast and how quickly it dances well, so you know amplitude and frequency in the x and y direction so Okay. It will not destroy uh, the logic of your script. Your, so the script uh, will be like um, pretty mess, messy, you know. But the logic and the functionality is still the same. It's just a component that we all over the place. And if you uh, uh, didn't have a backup, then <laughs> you might run into troubles. Anyway, the other one <laughs> I show, which is more serious, uh, was developed by my uh, friends Benjamin Fabrics. Uh, in fact, uh, he will do another workshop in this plugin for the iTech students. Um, so this one is. Flex Hopper, so it's um, it's a physics simulation engine, uh, but it runs on the GPU, so your graphics card, the NVIDIA graphics card, so it can simulate a lot of particles in uh, real time. So let's see. So in order to use this, your, your computer must has a graphics card from NVIDIA because it's used the uh, engine uh, that's only compatible with um, the NVIDIA graphics card. Oh, why there's no video here? Okay, so Benjamin actually make a whole video tutorial about how to use it, um, but um, let me just skip through some of the more, um, skip directly to the exciting part. Okay, so that's just like um, another physics simulation that um, done. This is not Grasshopper, by the way. This is just like a demo from Nvidia to showcase how how fast that uh, their um, their physics simulation. Uh, physics simulation engine can run. So this is like fast enough for that it can be interactive. So this is like for game. It's not something that you click the run button and then you know uh, come back one hour later to get a result. It's something that you see live. So it's used for game. Um, and it can deal with so many particles here. Uh, um. So anyway, um, so Ben integrates this into Grasshopper. Um, so let's skip to the part where it's actually start moving around and you see this we have a very dense uh, uh, mesh that simulates a piece of hanging cloth okay uh, here we go that this is like pretty dense uh, as you can see um, it's run fully interactive in real time uh, now in the next moment you're gonna see Ben's um, put in a collision sphere and how it collide with the sphere oh here he just freeze it and uh, Okay. All right, it's going live with the sphere on top right here, and everything's still like inter interactive. As you can see, he 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 spin the viewport around, and uh, as he changed the parameters, uh, he changed the coordinate of the sphere, like bring it lower. See how the system reacts live. So it's like you're almost like playing an interactive game. Um, the entire thing is open source, by the way. Um, the uh, the engine by NVIDIA itself is an open source, but the integration part is open source. And the way that Ben did it is that first he had to write a C# -sharp library that provide the, the 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 access to this core library, um, to to this core uh, NVIDIA um, um, Flex engines. 
and because he, he already have this C-sharp layer, you, he, you can easily integrate that into a Grasshopper plugin, or you can like, use C-sharp script component to even access all of these uh, uh, features. And, and, and the source code uh, the, the, um, of this uh, Flex software engine is uh, on GitHub uh, as well. That's actually the uh, location of the source code, github.com. Uh, or you, if you just Google for Flex uh, GitHub uh, or Flex Hopper, you, you will be able to get there. Okay. Um, Naughty Components is also open source, by the way. <laughs> if you go to Photo Rhino, you can uh, download the whole Visual Studio solution with the uh, source code inside uh, if, you, if you want to know how it works behind the scene. Um, all right. Now let's. Um, uh, let, let, let's carry on. So now we move to this topic, uh, a very important topic. Um, it can be a bit like heavy to uh, digest uh, at first, but um, there's no way avoid talking about this topic if you like do any simple form of scripting uh, these uh, these days. So even if you don't write plugin, even if you just want to script using either just Python or uh, the C sharp script component, uh, there's no way to avoid having to learn some object oriented uh, programming. So. Um, can you just uh, raise your hand if you never um, heard of the term object-oriented programming or never know how to define a class in programming? Uh, okay, that's fine. I will explain. Um, so, um, so far, um, we have been using the data types that ha have already been uh, predefined for us. So, like a uh, double string, which is a uh, common default with the C sharp uh, languages, uh, with the C sharp language, and uh, we have used a type that was defined by the Rhino common library, like uh, circle or uh, pawn three or vector three D. Now we um, can also define our own data type, uh, for example. Um, so we could, uh, the best way to understand this is to like have a, uh, an exercise or a live sample where you're gonna define our own custom data type. We're gonna actually define a custom type that represent a pyramid, okay? So uh, if you think about it, when you declare a pawn 3D, you have a pawn 3D object, you can say uh, .x, .y, .z, and you can access all of the property of that point, right? Um, now here you can do the pyramid. So let's say that if you want to represent a pyramid, uh, and the pyramid has uh, the base, plan, the length, the width, and the height. Now um, you can use four var separate variables to describe this pyramid, but then you end up with four separate variables, even though they are kind of meaningfully describe the same entity. So would it be nice if you can group them together in one object? It's just like instead of having three variable x, y, z that to describe a pawn independently, you have a pawn 3D, and this pawn 3D has the dot x, dot y, dot z goes together in, in, in like in one object. So it's feel nicer. So, so uh, at this level, a class is just a way to um, uh, to group data together. Okay, and uh, I'm sure like um, more than like half of you have done this in Python before uh, in the Python course that I uh, taught last uh, semester. But now we're going to do something similar in, in C sharp. And there's like subtle difference between uh, how to define a custom data type in um, uh, how to define a class in uh, Python or in uh, in uh, C sharp. So here, um, this is a custom type we call pyramid. We, we define using the class keyword, okay? And this code will not run. This code is just a template, okay? It's just like a function when we define a function. The function is not does it does not run unless we actually invoke it in the main part of the script. So so let's let's do it in the C sharp script component first, okay? Uh, then. Just, just a very short part of it, so you know where to write this part of the code in the C# script, script component, and then we will actually do it in Visual Studio. Okay, so let me open. Um, oh dear, what happened? Hmm. Uh, Time off. Okay, let's create a brand new C-sharp component, and <clears throat> oh, 
Okay, so let's open the C sharp script component and in the custom additional code, this is where we're gonna write the definition of our class pyramid. That is, that's again, go into represent any object uh, that any uh, object uh, that looks like a pyramid. Okay, so let's say class pyramid. Okay. If you have done this in on a language like Java before, you will see that the syntax is almost identical, frankly, um, but very different from Python. Okay, so you define a class, and the definition of the class itself, we go in this curly bracket here. So any object of pyramid must have uh, the following properties. Okay, so um, okay, so the keyword public, uh, you have to put it in front. Um, don't worry about what it means yet. Just put it in there, okay? And so the public, and then we declare a variable called base plan, and the type is plan, okay? So uh, type is always displayed in green, and the keyword of the C# -sharp language is always in blue, okay? So um, this means that whenever you have an object of pyramid or a variable of pyramid, it must has a dot base plan property, a dot length property, a dot width property. Just like when you create a, a pawn 3D, it must have a dot x property, a dot y property, a dot z property. Or when you create a circle, it must have a dot radius property and a dot uh, circle property. Okay. So so that is where we define the basic um, data type that a pyramid object should store. So double plan base plan. Okay. I'm sorry, it's not double, it's 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 a public plan. Okay. And remember a uh, plan is a type name so it should be displayed uh, using the green color or some other color. Um, but this code editor doesn't kind of do that so it's kind of lame. Uh, and by convention, even though this is a variable, and I've been telling you that variable is lowercase, but for public variable of a class, it's always start with uppercase. Okay, that is the convention. It's, it's not a rule of the language, but it's a convention. So, which means if you don't follow the convention, the code still runs, but it's gonna make it much, uh, much harder for somebody else to understand the code, uh, for example. And then we have um, the length. the width and the height okay so we just declare the existence of this property or variable okay so when a variable belongs to a custom class we call it uh, we technically we call it a field uh, but okay for now I, I just call it a, a class a variable okay and when you declare a variable you just declare that declare is assistant you don't really initialize a value yet okay because the value will be initialized later on when the object is being created uh, hi. Okay, so that's it. It's just like a simple way to group um, a plan and three numbers together in one object. Okay, so now how do you use this class in a main script? Okay, so yeah, let's create an object of type pyramid. So now because we have a custom definition already, we can create an object of class pyramid. So uh, let, let me switch on the PowerPoint slide because it has better color. So we declare, so in the main part of the script, which is called the client code usually. So we declare a variable called my pyramid. The type is pyramid. Okay, it's the same type of the class name that we defined early on. Okay, and then we use the constructor command. So the constructor always um, preceded by the new keyword. Okay, the constructor name, name of the constructor command or functions uh, or just constructor for short. Um, the, the name of the constructor always match the name of the type. Okay, always match the data type name. Okay, and this is the default constructor, so which means uh, we haven't defined any constructor here. We will talk about that later. So um, if we don't define any, we just use the default constructor, which basically just take in a pair of em empty brackets. And this will basically initialize a my pyramid object with, uh, with currently undefining uh, plan and length and width and height property. Okay? So this one is just make an, a variable that stop my pyramid, and then in the next slide you can go in and access the property that 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 the, that any object of class pyramid is supposed to have. Okay, so because my pyramid is clearly right, it's labeled as being of data type pyramid. It must have dot base plan. Okay, so we go in the dot base plan and we give it a value, and I will give it. Um, 
I will construct a new plan. So, so this this class is a plan is a is a type from Rhino Common, and um, I can create. This is just a world X Y plan. I can create it using the new plan constructor. But this plan is so common, so there is like a, a hard called a uh, special value for it from a Rhino Common library. So if you say plan dot world X Y, it will give you a plan that that basically at the world coordinate right at the origin, uh, the horizontal plan. And then we assign something to the length, width, and height uh, property. Okay, so nothing surprised there. Uh, it's just that, again, instead of having four variables lying around, now they are managed or owned by this master variable here. So it feels nice, you know. Uh, it feels like uh, clearer. Okay, so this is the uh, convention that I mentioned earlier. So it's a variable. Uh, uh, we call it a member variable of the class pyramid, and we it's uppercase, okay? So that is one... Okay, so this is um, okay. Let's type in the code, and then we gonna I'm gonna go to the next step. So um, so we have a class pyramid here. Now we're gonna actually create an an object or a variable that store a pyramid object. Pyramid new pyramid. Okay. Give it quite arbitrary value. Uh, oh, I'm, this should be called my pyramid because um, when I put it with my in, it's kind of have you. You kind of remind yourself this is a variable name, not not a class name. So it's a particular version of a pyramid. So we call it my pyramid. Oh yeah. Oh okay. If you do it in Visual Studio, oh, okay. Thank God, autocomplete does work. <laughs> okay. And after you have the value, you can later retrieve the value for my pyramid to do further lo uh, logic, right? But it's kind of uh, nice to group them under one thing. All right. Um, so that's one variable, so one particular instance. So when we have a class and we actually create an object of the class, we call we instance, uh, we make an instance of the class. It's just like of the data type pawn3D, it's called pawn3D, but when we use it, we have to create a specific pawn called my pawn, give it some coordinate, and then we can create another pawn. So each pawn is an instance of the type uh, of the class uh, pawn3D. But here we have the class called my pyramid. Okay. So before we do that, uh, but, so that is my pyramid, but optionally, we can create a secondary object, also of type pyramid, but this variable is it's a separate instance. It still belongs to the same class, but it's we call it your pyramid, okay? And your pyramid must also have this property, but the properties or, or the field, uh, can take different values. So they must have the dot base plan property as well, but the base plan can take different value, for example. For example, let's do it, uh, give it um, the XZ plan, the X, X plan, for example. And then it, it can also have um, width and height. Uh, anyway, you, you get an idea, right? Um, Okay, and now the constructor. So you might notice that it's kind of inconvenient to you know first declare an empty my pyramid and then have for extra line to initialize the basic uh, variable or, or member variable of the pyramid object. So if you think about it, when you do uh, when you define a pawn three D, you don't create a you normally don't create an empty pawn and then go in and assign X Y Z separately. It's gonna be very inconvenient. So what you do is that um, in pawn three, remember when you say new pawn three, you open the bracket and you have the chance to supply three numbers, and those three numbers will be interpreted as x y z coordinates. So you can create a brand new pawn using just one line. Okay. Uh, same with pyramid. We can define what how the constructor uh, behaves. So the con so we can define the constructor as follow. So constructor is a function. So this part is is the variable, but a class can contain variables and also a bunch of functions. Okay, 
Now, among all of those functions, the constructor is a very special one. Okay, so the constructor function must always have the same name as the class. Okay, the function doesn't have any return type. Okay, so remember when in C sharp when we define a function, it always have a return type. But 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 the um, uh, constructor doesn't have any um, uh, have any return type at all. Just the public keyword. And again, I haven't explained what public means, but uh, it will be clear in in a moment. Okay, so this constructor will take in four parameters. Okay, so wh so when we use the constructor, we open a bracket and we can throw in the actual plane, uh, throw in three different numbers. Okay, and the number will be stored in these input parameters. Okay, and notice that these are input parameters, so they are lowercase by convention. Okay, that that is like a simple way to distinguish between a member variable and this one. They have the same name but different spelling convention, and they are two separate things. This is something that we own by the class pyramid and this is just a, a placeholder for the input parameter to this constructor function when we use it later on. So uh, when the constructor runs, it will basically just take whatever the user pass in the base plane, the lowercase base plane, and start it in the actual real thing. Okay? Same with length and width and height. Okay? And for those of you who use, who use Python, this is similar to the init function in Python. Okay? So let's go back to my pyramid and I will define a constructor public pyramid. Okay, let's take in a plan. Base plan. Now with the constructor, we can change the uh, the, um, the 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 client call a little bit. So this time, rather than using the empty constructor and then manually access the property or the, the field or, or the member variable and like assign initial value to them, we can do everything inside the constructor here. Okay, so let me do this. So my pyramid equal to new pyramid constructor, and then we throw in the, the data. So plan dot world dot x y, and we throw in the number. Okay. Just more convenient. Okay, so so this one will become the dot base base plane property. This value will be assigned by the dot base plane because that is what we tell the constructor to do here. Okay, and this one will be length, width, and height. Okay, we can verify that by display my pyramid. So my pyramid. Okay, uh, okay, print, open and close bracket right away. Just a good habit. My pyramid dot length. Okay, which is supposed to be two, right? Um, and then to string, just a convert to string. If we run this, we will see that it's actually displayed two. Is there a way to print all of them at once? For all of the properties? Yeah. Uh, no easy way. There's, there are certain library that can okay. examine the content of the project and export yeah. it as a text file. Yeah, we have to do it manually in three lines. Okay, now with the constructor, we can create as many pyramids as we want, which is one line. So let's create another one, for example, um, like in your pyramid. Okay, so it's still a pyramid, but it has different value for width, length, and height. Okay.
All right. So again, for those of you who have never seen a concept of class before, so it's a it's a way to meaningfully define custom new data that share the same uh, collections of uh, properties, even though the actual value for the properties or the field are different. For example, if we have a cat, um, a class of cats, then you know if you have like a Tom cat and uh, you know another cat, they are both cat in the sense that they have the same variable they both have like legs and the ability to eat okay but they they belong to the same class cats but they are two different properties okay they, they they also have name but the value for the name field will be different one is called top and the other is called uh, what's the famous cat character i can think of like, <laughs> garfield for example okay but they both are cats they share the same property so this is two pyramids you know uh, they have different length width and height but they share the same property in the sense that they have the, the length uh, field they have the width field they have a field of properties, uh, but even though the value for those properties are different, okay? Okay, so now for those of you who um, do Python, uh, you will feel different. So in Python, um, you have an init function, and then you declare the variable inside it, the init function, but here you you declare the, the the variable separately. So when you decide a class, you have to think right away which variable that the class contains, okay? Before you even do the constructor. So it's kind of different from uh, Python. Okay, so, so far, uh, the class appeared to be nothing more than just a convenient way to store multiple data into one, in one entity and access them via the dot uh, notations. Okay, uh, this part we can kind of skip. But let's spend, uh, the constructor is just a function, which means we can overload it, right? Yesterday we learned how to overload functions, so a function of the same name but have different type of input parameters. So here in this one, uh, let's so below the, uh, the just the, the, the constructor that we define. So in the dot dot here was our original constructor. Below that, we define an extra or an overloaded constructor, which basically had the same name, and its job is also to initialize the the, um, the pyramid data. But this one is just taking three numbers, okay? Because assume that uh, the base plane is going to be at the word origin, okay? So it's only ask the, the user to supply three numbers, okay? And uh, we don't have to do this step. I think uh, we just look at, at the code for now. Um, and in the client code, we have my pyramid, which used the first version of the uh, constructor. So the first version that we did, take in the plane and free number, and then you know, your pyramid gonna use another, use the the overloaded or the second version of the constructor. Okay. And C sharp will automatically choose which one to execute because by just looking at the value. It, it can figure out uh, which is the right one to invoke, even though the so even though the name are pyramid, based even though they have the same name, but they are separate or they are distinguished by the the types of the input parameters. And we can also have a so-called uh, default constructor. Default constructor is a constructor that doesn't take in any parameters. Uh, Sometimes we want to provide this functionality because let's say that uh, you know whenever you it, Say new pyramid, and you don't you don't supply anything. Then we assume that you know every value will be initialized to you know some sort of sensible default value. Okay, so basically, a sensible default value would be the word x y, length, width, and high. You know, the sensible default value would be probably just one point So okay, so we have three different constructor. Uh, Okay, so now after we define the free constructor again, this is like when we actually invoke the constructor to get the real object. And yeah, we just have three different uh, versions. Okay, and you guys have been doing this in Python uh, all the time. Uh, okay, so it's just now it's just we doing it in C sharp. Okay, well in Python you cannot overload the function, but you can use the, the function that has been overloaded in C sharp. Here we we kind of doing that. All right. Okay, now this is the main point. Now this, we're gonna do this part for real, okay? So, um, a function so far is just a, for, for those, uh, uh, sorry, um, a class so far, for those of you who've seen class for the first time, so far a class is appear to be nothing more than just a way to group data together. 
but uh, when you do a class, um, you can also f specify a custom function that can act on a particular object of this class. Think about point 3D. If you have a point 3D object, you can say dot distant to, which is a function, right? And the function taking another point, and it do some computation and return a number, which is the distance from the current point to the target point. Uh, if you have a pyramid, you can, if you, set, if you have a, a, a pyramid object, which is stored in the variable called my pyramid that we kind of create early on, you can say my pyramid dot compute volume, which will execute this function for us, okay? But first we have to define this function inside the class. So the functions, again, uh, this um, uh, public keyword, uh, which uh, again, you still don't know what it means. So this is a function, the return type is double, the function name is compute volume. Now this function does not take in any extra parameter because this function already have all the information it needs to compute the volume. So the volume is just basically length times width times height divided by three, okay? So let's add in that thing. Okay, so here we have our constructor, which is a, the special function to initialize the data from scratch. And then we have a normal function. So normal function has a return type. So constructor doesn't have a return value and hence no return type. But here we specify that it return a double. And now the name. And we say return one third of um, length times width times height, okay? All right, now to use this function, so this is different from a normal, fu from the normal function that we used yesterday, okay? So, so yesterday when we write a function, and, we use, and when we use it, we just need to invoke a function. So yesterday we wrote compute cylinder volume, for example. We just need to like invoke the name. But now this function belongs to the class pyramid. You first, if you want to use that function, you first must have an object of type pyramid, which we already have. We have my pyramid, which is an object or a variable for that matter, of uh, an object of a type pyramid. And so if you do my pyramid dot, you will be able to access the functions that act on that pyramid, okay? Compute a volume, okay? And this, after, if we will return a number, and let's display that number, so print dot to string. Okay. And if you run that, you should see a number coming out that represents the uh, volume, okay? Being printed out right here. Okay, so it's the same function, but depends on whether you invoke it on my pyramid or invoke it on your pyramid, you will get different results because each of them will use the length, width, and height store in that particular object, okay? So the length, width, and height, this is the variable, but the value will be different for your pyramid and will be different for your pyramid, okay? So if you do the same thing, but this time from your pyramid, Okay, you will get a different answer based on the length width and the height of your pyramid. Okay, and that is probably the most, one of the most essential part you know about a class. So a class is a collection of common uh, field or variable that any object of this class must have, okay? The value can be different, but they must have this property, okay? So any human, I guess, must have a field called nationality, even though the actual value for that nationality can be different from person from person, okay? So same, uh, every pyramid must have an entry or a field called base plan, even though the, va the actual data for the plan is different from each pyramid to another pyramid, okay? And then each of them can, ha can, can have a 
what well, the, the function is shared among them. But when the function runs, it will use, it will act on the field, uh, the field data that belongs to each of the different version of the pyramid. Okay. So everything we write here again is just a placeholder, a template. This code will never be executed if we don't write this line here. These are the one that actually invoke the class. This will create an actual object, and this one actually invoke the the function that acts on the object. Okay. If you want to write another class, you go for custom additional code another part. Yeah, we'll just write here. Um, you can have another class maybe. So. Class. I mean that we have another custom additional code out of two. No, no, this is where you do. You can just you can write like infinite amount of code here. Mm -hmm. So this class, right, we have another class here. I don't have a good name, so let's say foo. Okay, and you see these two class exist in at the same level. They just like e equal to each other. You know. If you look up, you might notice an owner code we've been written is inside another class, which feels very, very strange. Like you define a class within a class, but don't worry. I told you all of this stuff that in the gray part you don't have to worry about. Okay, so. Which one? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, we don't. The class will just put in a space holder. We don't really need. We don't really have anything to define uh, right right now. So anyway, so that is how you define a class and use a class inside a C sharp component. Now, in a complicated, uh, uh, sorry, in a complex program or script. Uh, sorry, let me switch back to. Okay, so in a really long. Uh, program or logic or system, you might actually have more than one class because the logic requires you have more than one class. Each class has a lot of like functions in itself. So my pyramid has only one function which is called compute volume, but I mean, uh, it's, it's not hard to imagine that it also can have an additional function right here called um, public double compute surface area, for example, okay? It's just like a pawn 3D class can have many functions. So uh, imagine if you have to like write a complex piece of like uh, system that has so many class, and so not only the class definition is long, but the main part of the code itself is also so long. Um, you will um, you will find it's very annoying because everything lives in one like code file or text file, and you have to scroll up and down like crazy whenever you want to go to the relevant part of your code, right? So when you have a large complex, so this code editor is not meant for that kind of complex long code, okay? It's very difficult to edit, to work, to, or to, and to navigate uh, a long complex piece of code, right? So we're gonna do it in Visual Studio just to show you how to do it, okay? Uh, in Visual Studio, you, can, you don't have to write everything in the same file. You can split it over multiple files and they can still somehow see each other, okay? So, don't worry about if uh, this class, if you not manage to finish because I already prepared a code for you, we can copy and paste it in Visual Studio, okay? So you don't have to rewrite everything. So let's go to Visual Studio. Okay, still within our plugin uh, workshop, okay, we're gonna create a new file, but this file does not contain the source code for a custom component yet, okay? So this file will contain the definition for the class pyramid, and we will put it uh, in the same folder structure, so somewhere right here in the same uh, folder, in the same workshop folder, okay? So right click, add, new item. And this time, we basically want to choose the template. Uh, but bef but I think because I already give you the code, uh, maybe you can just choose the empty template. So let me double check. So if you go to the hands out, um, let's please, please go to the handout of day two and open the code starters folder inside the handouts. There is a text file called pyramid, okay? Please open the text file with notepad or whatever and copy everything. Okay, just uh, control C everything. Okay. We will paste it in the Visual Studio and I will explain it, uh, what it uh, again. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, just control C it. All right. Okay, now um, here. Okay, so we, we copy the code into the clipboard. Uh, now we're gonna create a new file. So add new item. And this time, frankly, we're gonna choose any template we want because we're gonna delete the content of the file and, and paste the code in anyway. So you can choose any template uh, you want. Um, by default, there's an empty one. Uh, I think it's called. Uh, oh, let's. Okay, j just choose this this template. We're gonna delete it anyway. We delete the content anyway. So this one, uh, the file name should be pyramid. Dot cs. So um, the file name should match the class name. Okay, pyramid. Dot cs. It's, it's a convention. It's not a requirement, but about the convention that the file name should match the class name. Okay, so you have a class pyramid here with these a bunch of templates code, but this is not important. So, Control A, select everything, delete it, and then paste in the code. Okay. Okay, so let me walk through the um, uh, uh, let me explain the code. Okay, so uh, you have a bunch of using statement. Again, don't worry about the using statement yet, and don't worry about the namespace yet. Okay, so if you don't worry about that, then red is just a definition of the class pyramid. Okay, the, it, this is the exact same definition that we wrote in the C sharp component, but now we just move it to Visual Studio. Okay, now at this part we just declare a class pyramid. It lives inside our uh, code, uh, our source code project. But it's not being used yet. It's just definition, right? Uh, as I said, when you define a class, but you never invoke it or actually create an object of Pi Pyramid, then you know the code basically never runs or it's not even useful. Okay, so we. But let's look at the content for now. So again, uh, class pyramid. The, the the a class pyramid has the four basic properties here. The constructor. It has um, like two versions of the constructor. Okay. Um, the remaining. Uh, okay, uh, we don't have the compute volume uh, function here, but we don't need to. Uh, I mean, uh, I did it in the previous example just to demonstrate uh, that a class can carry an, an extra function. Okay, now here we have a function that's actually output some geometry so that we can see the result on the screen. So this function, without going into into the details, don't worry about the details. Okay, what does this function does is that whenever you have an object of my pyramid and you say my pyramid dot compute display lines it will return a list of rhino line curve which you can output to the uh, grasshopper canvas to use and you can see the result <coughs> now the light the um, the display lines basically just the line that uh, along the edge of the pyramid so these lines are computed based on on the base plane and the length and the width and the height of of that particular pyramid okay so don't worry about this uh, logic for now. It's not um, really the, the main focus of this um, um, part of um, of day two. We, we focus on the structure of a class and why we need a class and why is it useful. Okay, the, this detail here is just like straightforward geometry computation and list manipulations. So don't worry about that. Okay. Uh, nice thing about Visual Studio, but also with the C sharp code editor, is that you can <laughs> condense the the definition to make it thing. So here you can see the structure very clearly. Uh, the structure of the uh, class very clearly two constructor one functions okay and four variables of four member variable or four member fields okay um, as I mentioned briefly yesterday I, I, I use the word function but in the C sharp language and in many other object oriented programming the word function is always being uh, read well, function is almost always being called methods. Now they are f for own purpose; they pretty much have the same meaning. But functions, like for historical uh, reason, like function was an old name, and then when when people do object-oriented programming, they find the word method like it's a better name for this function. So, so, so I use the word functions. But if you read the documentation and you know look on online forum when you Google for question, and if they use the word method, you know don't worry; they they, they have the exact same meaning as uh, functions. Uh, for our purpose, okay. All right. 
So this is the class pyramid. Uh, now we have to somehow find a way to use it. Okay. So the way to use it is that we're going to create a custom component that take in that take in a, a, a Rhino plan from for Grasshopper and take in three numbers. And from that, we can construct a pyramid object, compute a display line, and output a display line. Okay. So we define a class here, but we there's no way a, a, the Grasshopper user can access this pyramid class yet. So we have somehow have to create a component and expose all of the feature of functional functionality of the class into that component so the user the grasshopper user can use it okay so leave the source code file here so by conventions each class should live in its own source code file with that has the same name all right so now let's create a component called create pyramid so workshop dot add new item And this time we choose the grasshopper component templates, okay? And this is this this is going to be a class that represent the GHC uh, that represent a grasshopper component. So we name it GHC create pyramid. Okay, and put it in the the category workshop, please. Okay. Okay, this component will take in one plan parameter and three double, three number parameter. So p manager. Dot add plan parameter. Call the base plan. Plan, base plan. Mm. Dot item, okay. Um, the default value gonna be actually we don't need to de de define a default value. It's not really uh, important now. If you want, you can put in uh, a default plan value. But it's not important. And add number parameters. This going to read in the length. And the output gonna be a list. It's a list of uh, lie curve actually. So we output curve parameter, and we name it um, display lines or edge line. But let's call it display lines. So, so those are the lines that go along the edge of the pyramid. Okay, so these are the basic routine that we did uh, earlier this morning. Just declare basic grasshopper plugin. We're not really using the word uh, the class pyramid yet. Okay, this is a basic grasshopper plugin that take in four inputs and expect to send out one output. Okay, so
Now let's read in the data. So similar routine to what we did this morning. First, let's create a plan called I base plan. So this is the variable that we store the actual data for the input plan. Equal to plan dot um, world x y. It's just a default value. Double I length equal to one point zero. Read in the data. Okay, by now you should be familiar with all of this routine. It's, I know it's getting boring. I promise this is probably the last time you have to do it manually from now on. You will almost have the template code ready for you to do this like basic boring part, okay? So we can focus on the main logic. Okay, now we can access the class pyramid, okay? Let's see. We have all the data ready to construct a pyramid object using the constructor. So I will wait. I, I give you ten more, uh, like twenty more seconds to finish. Um, reach this point. Okay, thirty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the code is actually in the PowerPoint slide. Oh no, not really. Uh, sorry, let, let me switch back to the code. Okay. So just input and output de declaration so far, and, and we're actually reading the data. No, nothing fancy. One quick way to check if the code is like really error free is just try to build it to see if the build is successful. If it's not successful, there's some error, okay? Just like build it. Uh, we, don't, we don't test it, just build to see it, whether it's say build succeeded or, or failed. Uh, sadly, no. It's just the way the original, like, like when uh, David Runton set up this API framework, he kind of chosen this way, so it's kind of annoying. Uh, uh, <laughs> I would say DA dot get data, which return a value, and I can start that value right away. Yeah. But again, he reserved the main return slot for this boolean value to tell you whether it's successful or not. So it's kind of annoying. Okay, no worry. This is the last time you have to write all of this. Uh, yeah, I think so. So. Okay, if you build and have no error, then uh, we're good to go. Okay, if you test this in in the Grasshopper, uh, well, even though it doesn't like do anything for now, if you try to to you know um, run this component in Grasshopper, you will see that it have the right four inputs and like one output with this like given name, okay? But if you plug in the data, you will not get anything out because we haven't write that part of the code yet. Okay, so let me show you, um, now we're gonna access the class pyramid, okay? So, so far this component has nothing to do with the class pyramid yet, okay? So the class pyramid is in this file and uh, let's see some magic here. So Visual Studio <laughs> allow you to have dual panel. Isn't that convenient? So if you have a source code file that's usually in the same tab, you can drag it and 
you see this little uh, panel icon here. If you move it right here, it will snap to the right, and you can like see two source code files at the same time. Okay. So uh, actually, like any like code editor is supposed to support like uh, multi panels or, mu or like multi code windows, uh, for sure. So we have a class pyramid here. Um, we kind of condense. Remember, the, we, we condense the code so it kind of look clean. Uh, now these are two separate C sharp source code file, but they are located in the same project, and also in the same namespace workshop. Okay, I haven't explained the namespace yet. Actually, no, they are not in the same namespace, so they cannot see each other directly. So, can, uh, let's do one thing for me. Uh, go, go, uh, let's look look at the my, the pyramid source code file. Uh, the namespace, because we copy and paste this code from, from, from the code I provide you, it has this extra redundant thing called workshop.pyramid. Please remove the, the dot .pyramid part. Okay, so, so the two namespace match. Raise your hand if you need more time, or you're fine. Okay, I will come and have a Yes, because we could be, because we're gonna throw it in as an input parameter, as a ref keyword, you, uh, as a ref reference parameter. Uh -huh. C sharp require it has to be initialized. So if you reference parameter it has to be initialized, even though it will be overwritten later on anyway. Yeah, okay. So which, so that's why you have to give it a arbitrary value, which I just happen to be one. Okay, so again, we have two source code files, pyramid.cs and the GSC create pyramid.cs. Okay, so there is two separate files, but the code in this one can see the class pyramid in the other file. Well, proof, if you type pyramid, it will show up in autocomplete, okay? And the reason why they can see each other is because they're in the same project and they're also in the same namespace, even though I haven't explained what a namespace means, okay? Okay, so let's create an object of type pyramid. So the type name pyramid, and it should be displayed as uh, uh, green or a special color rather than black. Okay, and then uh, and the variable names could be my pyramid. Okay, this is okay. And now we actually invoke the constructor to get the right the real pyramid. Okay. Okay, we have to throw in some data into the uh, pyramid constructor. Okay, wh what do we throw in here? Well, we're gonna throw in the, the, the value that we just read from a uh, base plan length, width, and a height, okay? Remember the constructor, if I pull this panel over, the constructor, there's two versions, but we're gonna use the full version, the one that take in the plan and free double, and we already have those pen and, and the double here from, from outside of the classical canvas, okay? So we just need to forward them into, into the constructor, okay? Length with high. Again, please rely on autocomplete as much as possible so to, to avoid uh, typing mistake. Okay. 
All right. After we have the map pyramid, we can you know compute the volume, but we we didn't define the compute volume um, functions here. But we define the compute display lines, which return the list of line curve, right? So let's call my pyramid dot compute display lines again. It will be shown on autocomplete. Now this function will return a list of like curve, right? So because that's how we define it. So if you pull over the panel, um, it, it it you can see that it returns a list of like curve here. Or if you hover the mouse over the compute display line, it will also display the tooltip, say that it will return a list of like curve. Okay. All right. So we need to store the list of like curve in some temporary variable. So let's create a temporary variable of type list like curve. Okay, and let's call this display lines. Okay. So the line for displaying the or for visualizing for visualizing the pyramids. Okay, now we have display line. The final thing is to output them into the output port called display lines. Okay, otherwise we won't see anything. So the last step is um, what we have already done like the, the, um, this morning a lot. So uh, what's wrong here? Uh, so da dot set data list. Okay, because the input, the output parts, we declare the output parts as uh, as, as a list uh, access type, okay, so we have to use the function da.setDataList, okay, open bracket, okay, let's specify the name of the output part, well, we call the output part display lines, all right, so we should, we should put the name here, display lines, and the actual content is the list display lines, the C sharp variable is display lines. Okay, let, let's compute the code. Um, try it in Grasshopper, plug in a, a plan and three numbers, and you should see like um, some line curve going out that look like pyramids. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me answer two questions, one online and one for the people here. So, this is a very common problem to occur when you have a lot of parameters. Uh, each parameter has an English name, right, which is a piece of text, and then you later use that same English name to identify which input port you actually want to read the data in. Now, when you type this out, because this is a text, it's not, it's not a C-sharp code, but just a text. So there's no autocomplete, which means that you have to type it out carefully. If you accidentally mistype it, so for example, I forgot a T or whatever, and if you run it, you will get this uh, pretty common error, but it's quite unique. So whenever you see it, it almost is guaranteed to always cause by the mistype in the name. So if I reload that, okay, I, I will show you what the error message looks like uh, in a second. Create. Pyramid. Let's put in a little plan. Um, and then number. Okay, you get this error message, which is extremely hard to understand. It say, uh, what does it read? Uh, Input parameter minus one too low for a component create pyramid. Basically, in plain English, oh, that one is also in plain English, but you know, in even simpler English, it just means that there is uh, 
a, a typo in a typo that you either make here or you make here. If it doesn't match, then you always get an error message. Okay. This is sometimes maybe it's safer to use the index. So you know the base plan is the index is zero, so you can use uh, the index instead of the in the name. Yeah. So this one will potentially prevent some uh, errors. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so somebody asked me the questions why it doesn't. So the default value. Um, somebody asked me a question about the default value, which is kind of confusing. Um, so here we, there's two type of default value. So when you create a class, okay, this is just a poor. Uh, C sharp thing. This is the default value for a member of the pyramid. So if the constructor does not try to change uh, or to give a new value to to the length, width, and height, it will be the, this default value. Now this default value is different from the default value that the input part of the C sharp component uh, of of the grasshopper component will use. Uh, here we don't have any uh, input part default input parameters. Uh, value at all okay so you always have to plug in something okay so don't be confused between those two default one is the default value for the input part and one is for the pyramid okay then the, 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 and, and for this component there's no default value for the input part so okay I hope that's answered your question Okay, now the next question you might ask, well, can I just write the code that creates the pyramid right here? Why do I need to define custom class called my pyramid in another file and then have to call the constructor and then invoke these functions? Can I just like write all of the logic uh, that generates those lines right here? The answer is yes, but here's the problem. If you write a code in here, it's almost impossible for you to reuse this code in another component or another part of the code, right? So, uh, if your code is short and simple, you can write code in here. But it is, if it is something that is common and can be reused like pyramid, uh, it always makes sense to package it in the class so you can share and reuse it among other components. Imagine you have another component that also want to create a, my, my, uh, my pyramid, uh, but uh, it uh, compute, uh, but, but it gonna output the volume rather than the display lines, for example. Then you know uh, you can reuse the same class, for example. You don't have to. Um, so that's one benefit, okay? And as you see uh, tomorrow, by defining the class, by, by separating the uh, the logic of the class from from from, from 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 the code of the components, this part we can easily reuse uh, from 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 Python as well. So let's say that uh, you have this plugin that support the class pyramid that you know introduce a new geometry type pyramid to your grasshopper modeling environment. And you give this plugin to your friends. Now your friends can if your friend doesn't know how to use Python or C sharp, he can rely on this component in grasshopper to get a pyramid. But if somebody else knows C sharp or Python, they will also be able to access this thing directly. Okay, so they can be able to um, use the C sharp two component or the Iron Python component to access the pyramid class directly as well. And for now, we don't have a lot of functionality here, so this class is not that particularly useful. But imagine that this class like represent a whole engine that can compute lighting simulation. <laughs> Obviously, you can use Python and access all of these features. It's gonna be nice. Okay, if you had if you write all of the logic right in here, it will be pretty much impossible to reuse it anywhere outside of um, this uh, grasshopper component, okay? Okay, now the next thing I want to show is uh, just a brief introduction. It's a very useful thing um, 
to do. Uh, but uh, so when you write large plugin, of course, you it's almost impossible to write a bunch of code. Click the the, the play button and get it work for the first time. You know. Even if you spend like your the last part of your life like coding like me, it's almost impossible to write like more than let's say a thirty lines of code and let it get, and have it run there correctly in the first time. Okay, in that case, you need some extra tool that help you kind of understand the code in a more detailed manner, so you can like kind of locate where the bug is or put the potential problem is. Um, now the code basically just run like instantly and you know you see the result or either an error message okay and you have no clue if, if there's an error message you know you rely on, on the error message to kind of guess the problem but would it be nice if we somehow slow down the speed of, of the code execution so that if let's say if the, the, the execution get into this line and we can pause it and look okay at this line my length is two and I can look at the status of all of the variable and I, I can like understand my program structure uh, better now that technique is called line by line debugging. Okay, where you can actually make the engine that execute the code kind of execute it line by line, and you can pause or like play uh, the flow uh, according to the flow. Now, um, for those of you who use uh, Python in uh, Rhino, you kind of uh, familiar with this tool. But even though the that that line by line debugging in in Rhino Python is kind of limited, but in Visual Studio it's very nice. You have like a full line by line debugging. So let me show you how it works. So this is the code. Uh, we, so normally what we have done is we compile it into a GHA file. The GHA file will we, we, we contain the, 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 um, like the, the compiled code, and Grasshopper will just run that code. And when Grasshopper run the GHA file, Visual Studio has nothing to do with it. Visual Studio just like sit in the background, and the GHA file is run by Grasshopper. So you know, but it's possible to ask. Uh, Visual Studio to monitor what happened when that GH file is being used, okay? And it can kind of stop the execution of a code at a certain point. All right, so let's get into line by line uh, debugging in Visual Studio, okay? So let's uh, close Rhino for now because we're going to start up another version of Rhino, a very special version that uh, allows us to track what happens going on the code. And to avoid uh, confusion, let's let's close everything. Just keep uh, Visual Studio. <clears throat> okay, S uh, my program still not. Close. Come on. Okay. First, make sure that the code is will be built in debug mode. Okay. Um, so when you compile the code, there is two way to compile it: either the debug mode or the release mode. Now, release mode is what you want to choose when you confident that your product is finished and you're gonna build it for one last time before like distribute to your friend or customer. Okay. That's why we run at the full speed. Okay, the most efficient, the, 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 the compiler or the, 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 um, the build engine will optimize the code so that it runs the fastest. But the downside of that, because the code has been optimized, is very difficult to, to use it with the debugging tool. Okay, so if we compile the code in the debugging mode, it will run slightly slower. Actually, in this case, it's almost not noticeable. Okay, but it will allow the debugger to analyze the code and stop the code and you know print out the value of the variable at that particular moment much better. Okay, so make sure that we're in the debug mode. Okay, let's build it once. Just rebuild it. Okay. And now uh, we can start the debugger, but before we start that, we have to make sure that the debugger will automatically uh, attach itself or, mo or, or, or monitor Rhino, okay? Because, because this code is not run by its own. It runs by the host software, Rhino, so Visual Studio needs to somehow see Rhino in order to be able to monitor it. So if we go to... Um, this is just a checking step. I'm sure that it has been set up properly by the Grasshopper like code template wizard when we set up this project. But let's double check. Let's go to properties. Okay, let's go to properties and go to the debug category, the debug tab. Okay. 
make sure that in the start external program it points to the rhino.exe file so this is the the, the actual rhino application uh, okay so it should be there by default okay but if you don't see it and you have to manually uh, browse to the rhino.exe on usually on your rhino uh, on your c program files uh, folder okay all right so that's basically this slide tells that whenever I click the debug button or the play button, it will fire up Rhino Studio. Uh, it will fire up Rhino and monitor that particular version of Rhino. Okay. So the one that we have been using so far is like run independently uh, from Visual Studio, but this one it will be monitored by Visual Studio, and you will see it will be run a bit slower than normal because Visual Studio have to constantly monitor it, and you know that's why Rhino will appear to be a bit slow. All right, so with everything ready, let's fire up the, uh, uh, again, uh, I, I just reviewed one more to make sure that I have the latest version of the code. All right, and now I can start the debug by either, I think it's F6, or press the start button here, but uh, you can also go to debug and say uh, F5, I think, okay. So start, okay, you will see Rhino will start in a moment, and again, this Rhino will run a bit slow because Okay, so Visual Studio will go into the debug mode, okay? And you will, and you will know that because the red underscore here. Okay, so Visual Studio will, not, will no longer be in the editing mode anymore. We will switch to the debug mode, okay? And this is where it's very helpful if you can have a second monitor where you can have Visual Studio in one and Rhino in the other. But now we have only one, so I have to constantly switch between the two. All right, so we have Rhino running in parallel, being monitored by Visual Studio. In of Visual Studio, we check how much memory that Rhino is being used right now. Okay, so if you if your uh, plugin happened to like do some weird thing and you know use up like five gigabytes of uh, memory, you will be able to spot the anomaly here as well. Okay, in some case, if you want to do like some really hardcore agent-based simulations, uh, for example. All right, so let's switch back to Rhino. Okay, then let's start. Grasshopper, uh, you will also notice Grasshopper will start slower than usual. It will take slightly longer to load. Okay, and now let's, okay, now we have to force the, the code that we wrote in Visual Studio to run, right? And okay, the, the simple way to do that is obviously just uh, create uh, the um, pyramid component. So. P create pyramid. Okay, now we force this component to run, and it will run. It basically will trigger the code inside Visual, uh, Visual Studio. Okay, so let's put in the base plan uh, x y. A number. Okay. Okay, it runs, but okay. Um, Okay, let me do a, sp a split screen here. Uh, okay, I have Visual Studio on the right and Grasshopper on the left. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, this is like really useful to have two monitor. <laughs> Okay, Visual Studio and Grasshopper. Remember, everything going on here with this monitor. Now we just run the component. Okay, it just uh, turned from orange to uh, to uh, to um, to white, which means that this part here had just been executed, but, but it was executed so quickly, so it just like woof, passed through. Okay, so let's we, we in a moment we're going to run this component again by just like do right click and. We compute to force the component to run again, but before we do that, we're gonna set a breakpoint. Let's say right here. So, uh, if you click on the margin, you can put a red breakpoint, which means that whenever the code execute and hit this line, it will pause right there, and you can go in there and check what's going on with your program. Okay, so put a breakpoint there, and if your breakpoint is not red but uh, hollow, uh, white, then which means that that will mean that Visual Studio is is not tracking uh, uh, Grasshopper properly, okay? But I hope you should get all of the um, solid red dot here, okay? All right, now, if I force this to run, again, it will go in very quickly. Like, the first two lines will be like, 
execute in like fraction of a millisecond but as soon as they hit this line it will stop and you will see an, a yellow arrow appear right here to signify that it has stopped recompute go in boom stop right there and now the ex the code stop which means that grasshopper will freeze yeah. Yeah. okay so it will freeze as long as, as, as long as you stop the code here but okay before we we hit the continue button and let it like run at full speed again um, you can Visual now is in debug mode, so it will stop it at breakpoint and show you the status of the variable. So I length currently has the value of 1.0 because that's what happened in the previous line. Okay, okay. So this line uh, hasn't been executed yet. The, the execution point is at the beginning of the line. Let's let's step to the next line. Okay, so so let me explain. So if you hit continue, it will keep running again. Okay, uh, like at full speed. But if you only want it to run a like to to the next line and stop again. Then look at the menu. There is a button called step over or F10. Okay, so if you do step over or F10, it will go to the next line. Okay, so the execution is now at the head of the uh, next line, and and at this stage, the variable I with the value will now be updated to one. Okay, so you can slowly monitor step by step what's going on in your program. Okay, so height, height is now zero because at the beginning of the line, uh, height just like hasn't been, this line hasn't been executed yet, so height doesn't have any value. So, but if I step over to the next line, F10, you see height will become one because this line has finished its job successfully. Okay? Okay, now more usefully, so let's read in the, the base plan and then we can look at all the property of the base plan. Okay? So after this line, let me step over. Okay, now if I'm left at four, like 44, then the base plan has been written. So I base plan, okay, now let's look at the content of I's base plan. Uh, on the right, it says the value, okay, uh, the origin is 0, 0, the x axis is 1, 0, 0, so you know, the, the full status of, of our variable. Um, now I base plan is a plan object, right? And remember, an object has property of field and you can expand this and see all of the field okay so the the dot origin field the dot origin x field okay everything is here all right and let's carry on uh f10 again now here my pyramid if i just pass through this line okay now my pyramid my pyramid look at the property my pyramid dot height is two because that's what i put in okay so if there is a problem, this tool will help you kind of start to understand uh, your code more. All right. So uh, now there is quite a unique feature of Visual Studio. Um, when the code is paused, you um, not only you can fast forward it, you can you know reverse the code execution by dragging the yellow button here backward. Okay. Go back in time, so it's, it's kind of weird, but <laughs> it's actually possible. Not, not always, you not um, you will not be able to do this all the time. There's sometimes it it logically impossible to reverse the state of the the program. Okay, this one is just a linear flow, so it's, it's possible. But if you have a with if statement and a for loop, uh, it's difficult to reverse. All right, so <clears throat> let's see uh, why the course is running. Let let's see that I I clearly see that there is um a a problem in this line, I can stop here and I can change it. Let's say, let's make this read in as I, I length, for example. I can change it live while the debugger is running, okay? And the code will be recomputed kind of in the background. Now, this feature does not work all the time. There's some chance that will break the debugger and then you have to stop the debugger and start it again, okay? Okay, so now, of course this time the program is clearly, clearly wrong, but I just like, want to show you. Okay. Right, so pass through and, you know, uh, I left, I will, let me change back to I haste. Okay, let me show you another extremely common mistake with, uh, with C sharp programming, okay? Um, but before I do that, uh, let's step into. So, so this code, if you do step over, it will just let me start from here again. Step over, we just go to the next line. Okay, let me go into this line and stop here. Now, this line, actually, it will call the constructor, right? 
What if you want to go into the constructor and see the execution inside? Okay. Well, there's two ways to do it. You can open the uh, the source code where you know this thing is. Uh, so open that file. It's in the Solution Explorer. Um, Pyramid, okay, and you can set the breakpoint at this one because you know that this one will eventually get in here, right? And if you press the play button, it will go in here and eventually hit this breakpoint, all right? But there's another way, more kind of controlled way to do it. So rather than step over by F10, there is the button called step into. Okay, so step into will go to the current uh, function that it needs to expand. So that will should go to. So it's go to the class pyramid actually. Uh, so let's step out, okay, and then step in again. So that we step into the constructor. Uh, so the first, uh, so so now you see this button here. Uh, it's right here. So now we want to step into this constructor. So let's step over again. Step into again. Ah oh, no, it's passed through. Damn it. Okay, let me reverse it. Okay, this time I have to use breakpoint. Set the breakpoint right here. Okay. Let me open dual panel. Okay, execution is here, breakpoint is here. I'm gonna know that the execution is gonna go here in a minute. So I, I set a breakpoint to stop it in advance. Press the continue. It will zoop right going right there, okay? And then now you can look at. And if you finish everything and you want to step out of this one, so you want the code to, fin to, to go into the end, quit this function and come back to this line, you can you can simply say step out. Okay, step out will mean it will finish the rest of this function, and return to to the outer layer of the code execution. Okay, so no matter how complicated your code is, you can like really like go follow step by step. Okay, and of course it's really useful if you have like two or three monitors. So that's why I invest in this one where you can carry around uh, at work. It's a separate monitor that doesn't need uh, extra uh, electricity. It's, it's just a screen and you need a USB cable for both power and video transmission. So, and it's just a USB. So if you have more than two and have more than USB port, you can have like a dual panel uh, to win as well. And you're gonna look like either a um, hardcore hacker or a Wall Street trader. <laughs> Okay, so now knowing how the um, this thing works, let me show you another scenario where it's also useful. Okay, so um, you can safely stop the debugger now. Uh, stopping the debugger uh, by pressing the stop button, we also close that version of Rhino. Okay, and next time we will debug, it will start uh, Rhino again. All right. Um, it's very common for this bug to happen. So let's say you declare a variable, but you don't initialize it, so by default it will be null. Okay, so here I intentionally make a bug there, an error there, by making it null. If you have a null object and you try to say null, uh, my pyramid, which is null, and you try to compute this by lines, you will get a classic error in C sharp. It say that, okay, it's a very weird uh, uh, error. Say object reference not set to an instance of object. Basically, in plain English, it means that that goddamn variable is null. Okay. And when you see that message, it's very difficult for you to guess what, what happened. Well, here it's obvious because I put in the word noon here, so it's kind of tell you. But that lie can happen like way above. So, so there's no way for you to know why it's caused, right? So with lie by lie debugging, if you run the code in debug mode and it hits this lie and cause an error, it will stop right here. And at least you will be able to know which lie the problem happens. Okay, so again, I put in that intentional mistake there. Let's start the, uh, this thing again. Okay, and now if I run it, even without a breakpoint, it will stop at line 49 because that's like completely break the, the program. It cannot proceed any further. It's a fatal error. Okay, so. Create pyramid. Okay, uh, you don't have to do this step. I just like demonstrate, and again, it will be recorded on the video, so you can always watch all of this step again. Okay, let's put in a basic plan. That's why I see. Okay, it will go here. Get an error, and this error. If if you uh, it's error the message is a very common one but it's extremely generic it's just basically that there's something that uh, this thing is noon and you can hover the mouse over and see this one is clearly noon my pyramid current value is noon okay now if you let us run through this error will manifest itself in 
a red error message, and it's the same message that you get here. So Grasshopper just basically forwards the message that the C# -sharp engine spit out and displays in the balloon for you. Okay, so that's why it's like very cryptic because it, it's originally a C# -sharp message. So when you see it in Grasshopper, it's just very hard to understand. Um, but usually it's always caused by a noon. And with debugging, at least, uh, let me force it to run again. Okay, you notice it's noon. You can at least step backward a little bit. So my pyramid, if you highlight my pyramid, it will show you all of the lines where my pyramid is being used to code. And then you go to that line and find out which one caused the problem. Okay? So it's potentially useful. Uh, the C-sharp code editor in, in Grasshopper, when you highlight a variable, Double click on that, it will not highlight the other one. So you have to do Control F to shut for everything as if you shut a Microsoft Word file. So it's like really, uh, <laughs> really um, pathetic, I have to say. All right. Now let me stop the editor. So I'll stop the debugger. Okay. And let's change this slide back to the functional one. Okay. My Control Z is not working anymore. Oh, because I'm in the US mode. All right. Control Z. Okay. Um, now, just a few nice uh, features of uh, Visual Studio. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, if I make a mistake, uh, let's see if we can correct it. Rename. No, it cannot find the I hide one. It asked me to rename it. So, anyway, so um, let's say that if you have a long piece of code and you have the class pyramid, and you you can't remember exactly where this class was defined. Okay, because there's so many source code, there's so many files, right? Um, you can right click on the class name and say go to definition. It will, def it will take you right to the definition of a class. So even if this file is closed, okay, right click and say go to definition, boom, it will take you right there. Okay? And when you're done, you can step backward, it's just like an um, internet browser where you can just like, go backward. Okay? Same with the constructor. So you don't know if you don't know where this constructor was defined, right click and say go to definitions, it will take you right there. Okay? And same with parameters. Uh, like I hide, uh, if you can't remember where you first declared, if you say right click and say go to definition, it will take you to right to this line. Okay, this is something that you cannot do in the C sharp uh, script editor in inside Grasshopper anyway, and it's very important for you if you want to work with a large uh, project. Now another nice feature is that, okay, let's go to this function compute display line. Let's say that uh, you name it compute display line. Okay, uh, let me open two files. So that is the original file, and then uh, this one, I, let's open it in dual panel. This is a feature that you will be using a lot as well. It's called uh, automatic, uh, uh, automatic renaming or refactoring. If you happen to change your mind, want to name it something like, for example, um, a better name would be compute edge lines, okay? Now, if you change the name here, obviously, this one will no longer be valid, right? You get an error if you run this code. So you have to change here. Uh, see, two seconds later, it's detected that this is wrong. Okay, now, if you use it, you can change it manually, but if you use it like 100 places in the code, there's no way you can like change everything, right? Of course, you can do a search and replace in, as in Microsoft Word, but that one is dumb because it's just based on, on the text, not on the uh, meaning. So if you have another class that happens to have the function of the same name, that will also be accidentally be changed. Okay? So how do you do it in Visual Studio? Let me reverse this back to the original one. Okay, so whenever you change um, the function name, okay, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this one is uh, the usage and this one is the definition. Let's say if you want, oh shit, if you want to uh, change the name, okay, as soon as you finish changing the name, a lot, you will have the chance a little light bulb will appear. Come on, yeah. And at this moment, you have the chance to click and say rename display light to edge light, and it will do it everywhere. So if I click that, you will see that, that name on the, on the left will be renamed as well. Okay, everywhere, okay? So very useful feature to have. You can do the same thing with class. So for example, instead of my pyramid, I would say awesome pyramid. Okay, now. There's a light bulb. Usually, it's sometimes it's appear on a margin. Sometimes it's appear right underneath. Right click and say, rename pyramid to awesome pyramid, and then you will see that the constructor will be renamed, the class type name will be renamed everywhere. Okay, so okay, let's put it back to pyramid. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. All right. Uh, I think we can have uh, a break for 15 minutes. So let's carry on at um, what for uh, for 50. Okay. Let's carry on. Um, Let's talk about um, a, a small little thing about object-oriented programming, and then we will skip directly to um, the major exercise. Uh, like it's going to be challenging, but also fun and interesting. Uh, and after you finish uh, doing this exercise, you can play with the system, experiment with different parameters, and you know you can have like some kind of fun designing or exploring or adding uh, additional features. Um, we will not finish this exercise entirely today. So we, today we got, got the basic feature uh, working, and tomorrow we add in like some feature to make it faster, and adding some feature to make the geometry somehow uh, nicer and more kind of varying. Okay, so but before that, let, let's finish uh, this thing about object-oriented programming first. So one thing that I haven't explained to you is the uh, keyword public and uh, what well, the opposite of it, which is uh, private. Now, I want to explain it to you because just in case you see a sample code online or when you look at the documentation and you see this keyword, you know what it means and how it affects your usage of the code, okay? Oh, the um, streaming, yes. Forget the screen, sorry. Okay, so public and private. Uh, so by default, everything is public. Okay, which means that this field can be accessed in the main part of the code. So for example, if I have a pyramid, I can access its length because it's public. So from outside of the class definition, I can access it. I can query the value, I can change the value, it will be fine, okay? Um, and a public function means that I can also use it or invoke it outside of the code. If it's not public, then it's only meant to be used internally inside for, for the code inside the pyramid's definition itself. Okay, but so public is, is just a standard behavior. You know, if you use uh, Python, everything is public by default. You don't never use the keyword public in Python, but it's public by default. Um, but public can cause a funny problem. So in this case, because length is public, so anybody can access and modify it and put in some like silly value. For example, put in a negative value for the length, and then it is like it doesn't cause a problem yet. But let you compute the volume, it will get will give you a negative answer. And if you try to use a negative volume in other part of the code, it will cause like unexpected behavior. Okay, and currently there's no way to stop the person who used the class pyramid from like doing uh, such um, silly thing by the, either intentionally or um, unintentionally. So we can stop the user from publicly uh, as access it by making it private. Okay. Now by naming convention, if we make something private, we should change the name to the lower case. Okay. But it's still the same thing. It's just that now you cannot access from the outside. So if this thing is marked private, then it can only be available to the code inside a pyramid. Okay. So the function compute volume can still use position because it's in the same class. Okay, but anything outside of the class, if you try to access it by dot length, you will get an error message here, and the error message would read something like length is inaccessible due to its protection level. Okay. Uh, the annoying thing is that if um, a well-behaved user, you know, if he just wants to simply query the value of the length rather than modifying it to a silly value. Now he can't do it either, so it's it kind of overly protective now. So it's safe, but then you know it's become very restricted. So now if you try to accept dot length and to display it, it will also get the same error message. So um, traditionally, the the solution is a bit, you know, uh, unfortunate. We have to write extra piece of code to allow a well-behaved user to query the value of the length without modifying it. Okay. So we make the field a length private, okay? So you cannot access it directly. But whenever you want to query it, okay? So inside the class pyramid, you define an extra function, or just a utility function, okay? Called get length. And what it does, it just simply return not the variable length itself, but just the value of it, okay? So if length is one, it will just return the number one, okay? And, and this just return the value, not it does not provide access to this field, so there's no way the, the user from outside can modify it, okay? But he can still query the current value inside. 
Um, okay, so this is how he would use the get length function to get the the number of represent the length. Okay, uh, it's few annoying though. It, it's much nicer to say my pyramid dot length and get the value, right? But now you have to say get length, and then the bracket. You know, you have to. You know, the person who write a function must provide this extra functionality, and the person who use it must, you know, type out these functions to, to do a simple task. So it's kind of annoying. But this has been the way that that um, this is the way it has been like for a long time. Like so, if you um, happen to do C plus plus, like back in the old time, and if you have a massive library and if you have a class, then each class, each variable is basically private, and if you want to change the value or get the value, you have to use the get or set functions, which is annoying, but it's the way to make sure that nobody can mess up with the value unintentionally. So if you have a program that is running, and then somebody can get access and modify it, it will like make the logic kind of uh, corrupted, either intentionally or unintentionally. Okay, that's also, so apart from the get method, you know, usually we can also define a set method to allow the the user to change the length, but not in a, in an unrestricted way. So okay, so let's say that length is private, so there's no way you can from outside you can say my pyramid dot length and give it minus one point two. You have to do it via this extra functions. Okay, so this extra function is set length. Okay, and it will take in a new length. Okay, but because it's a function, it can you can write some extra code here. Let's check if new length is a sensible value. Okay, if it is a sensible value, then you assign it to length. If not, you make length zero point one, which is probably the smallest sensible value. Okay, so you can do some extra logic just to prevent that silly. So if somebody throw in minus one point two or whatever, this extra code will prevent that situation from happen essentially. But um, again, it's also annoying because now instead of saying my pyramid dot length equal to Two or something, it's, which feel natural, right? Now you, they have to say set length minus one point zero. Okay. So can we get the best of both worlds? Uh, the answer in C sharp is yes. Um, it's a bit. Um, we. I explain this to you just so that when you look at the documentation, you know how to use this properly. It's actually very simple to use, but sometimes if you get an error, an, a mess, an error message that stops you from using it, you kind of know why you can't use it that, that way. Um, we are not going to, to define the get and the set ourselves, okay? So, so let's compare. So pre, this is how we use the set functions, okay? And the get function. It is not as nice as just do the natural way, okay? But this way we know it's unsafe, right? We can, if we access directly to the field, we can modify it like in an unrestricted way. This one, if we do set length, there's the if statement inside the function to, to prevent funny situations. Okay, so can we get the best of both worlds? Can we have this nice syntax, you know, elegant syntax? But this syntax basically do the exact same thing that the set length does, okay? Um, and let's call them properties in, in C Sharp and also in VB and, and also in Python uh, these days. Um, and again, I will just skip through it so you know what it is. We're not going to actually define the get and set for our class because it would just make uh, the thing a bit tedious. Uh, but because all of the Rhino common properties are you know, exposed to you this way, so it's why it's important uh, to know. So, properties of a class. So, if a class pyramid, this is um, how I told you we have been doing this. So we make the length private, okay? And we expose the ability to query and to change the value by this extra function here. So every variable you make it private and then you provide to a, a get function and a set function. In case where that function is read only, where it doesn't make sense. For example, you cannot change the volume of a pyramid directly. You can only query it, right? But you cannot change the volume directly. You change the length, and then hence it changes the volume. And you can query it, but you cannot change the volume directly. So in that case, there is no set volume, for example. So you can like just not provide a set function altogether uh, for certain fa for certain um, value that you meant that that was meant to be uh, read only. So. Um, so this is how we do it uh, in uh, the modern uh, programming uh, way of C sharp. So um, we make the field private, okay? But we we de define a property. So property is uh, this is like um, new C sharp syntax that going to be introduced right here. So the property. So this field 
will be represented by a property, and the property is usually public, and the property is usually have the same name but with the capital letter. Okay, so, and the properties will contain a get. With basically a special function, but you know we use the keyword get, and get is just basically return the value of length, okay, and and if you define the get this way, now in the main code when the user use use the equal operator, uh, uh, um, when the user query dot length, okay, length appears to be just a normal field, okay, but actually it's a property. So when you do this, it will automatically invoke the get function here and return the value so there is no weird get length and then bracket anymore because this is not you don't have to use the weird uh, function syntax to just to query it you can use the property as if it's just a normal field but it's kind of safe right and then the set function okay so so the set functions will take in the value and put in a special keyword and then you can check if this value Larger than zero. If it's uh, larger than zero, you put it into this private field length. Okay. Otherwise, you make it zero point one or zero point zero. And so this is the definition of a set. But when when the user actually use it, this is where it we, is being invoked. So the user say my pyramid dot length as if this is just a normal field. Okay. And then we say equal to. But what happened is that we trigger the set functions. Okay. So 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 it's more convenient for the user to, to use uh, because it looks like this is just a normal public variable but it's not a variable, it's actually a, a function being invoked here and the function will do some like um, code checking. Now um, this is a new syntax, we're not going to write it ourselves, I explained it to you just so that when you look at random comment um, you understand So let's look at um, point 3D. Point 3D struct. Okay, so point 3D, um, this is not a class, but a structure. But for now, it's actually identical to a, uh, to a class. Structure is, is think of it as identical to a class for now. Tomorrow we will talk, we will talk about this important difference between a struct and a class. But for now, think of circle or pawn three D as a class. Okay. So there are certain things uh, I want to actually do pawn three D. Um, Okay, so pawn 3D, the class pawn 3D, or the data type pawn 3D, um, or the structure actually, struct. Okay, pawn 3D has a bunch of constructor. We know what constructor means now. It's a special function where we uh, do, compute things from scratch. Uh, if you scroll down, you have the methods. So, uh, so if you have a pawn, and if you say my pawn dot distant to, and then open bracket, and give it something. So the method is the function. So uh, again, method and functions are just mean the same thing. They are just like synonym, like there was different two different English words, but they mean the exact same thing. Um, so those um, function or, or, or methods uh, act on the point. But uh, so in addition to constructor and methods, you also have properties. Now they're not called field or variable because in modern programming practice or in any modern like C sharp library, all of the fields are private. You will never be able to access it. You always access it through the properties. So remember, the length is simple, it makes private, and then it is represented by a properties, okay? And from our user point of view, it feel, it looks and feels like, like a public variable, but it's actually a field. But the field, uh, some field provide both the set and the get method. For example, when you say my pawn dot x, it will do the get method and return the value, okay? But if you try to say my pawn dot x equal to, you try to change it, it will say that, X had no set method. You can only get the value, but you cannot set the value. Okay, which feel a bit weird, but let me show you. Um, you don't have to follow this step. I just want to show you. Um, I'll just show you the error message. So if you have a point three, my point equal to new point three d three three three. Okay, if you say my point dot x and you print it out, okay, um, dot to string. Okay, this will invoke the get of the property capital X oh inside um, we don't have a print command here actually so um, but here we just query the value so I say double my x coordinate 
Okay, this is on fire and good. Okay, no error. But if you try to change it, uh, for some reason, um, this one ghetto said, oh, you can change it now. Actually, somebody have Rhino 5 can try it because I, remember, we can, you cannot change the XYZ individually in Rhino 5. Hmm. Anyway, but there's one thing that you cannot change. Okay, for example, um, the length. The length you can query, obviously. Oh, um, pawn doesn't have um, length. Uh, it's, let's use vector instead, okay? Okay, so my, my vector. Okay, my vector has the length property, which if you say dot length, it will basically trigger the, the, the get special method my vector and return uh, the number that represent the length of this guy okay so my length double l equal to which is fine okay but length doesn't provide a set method which means if you try to say vector dot length and try to change it you can error message and just say property vector 3d dot length cannot be assigned to it is read only okay because it no has set method in this case, it makes sense because you cannot change the length of the parameter directly. You change the x, y, z, and hence the length follow. Okay? Um, the design intention of a Rhino common library is that the, the vector, the length, is not something that you scale, uh, that you can change directly. You have to change the x, y, z, and then the length will follow. The length is just like uh, a report parameter or, or a report value uh, or field to report the current length, not something that you use to modify the vector itself. So many fields will, some few have set, some few have get method. Okay, but some of them uh, have only one, for example. So if you look at documentation and you see the word properties, um, remember that property is not the direct access to the uh, private variable. It's just a way for, to shift the, the, the value in and out to the private field, okay? Okay, so that's all uh, you need to know. Um, now, when we write code, as you will see from now on, I will just make everything public, <laughs> which is actually a bad practice in real life, but we want to keep it simple and make almost everything public. Certain things we will make it private because those things I know for sure that there's no reason for us to access it from outside, but I will not make this get and set because it just makes things uh, complicated uh, for us. But when you look at the Rhino Command documentation and other documentation for other programming library, not just for Rhino or Grasshopper, but many other programming library, and you see these properties with the get and the set, you know what it means, okay? So let's keep. Um, so um, w there's much more important thing to talk about object-oriented programming, but we will save that for tomorrow. So this part is just theory. We're not going to actually write code about this, but it's important to understand so that when you look at the Rhino Common documentation, you know the relationship between this class and you know how to use them properly. It's very hard to like fully exploit, or you know sometimes it's impossible to use a functionality without understand uh, this advanced concept in object-oriented programming, like inheritance, uh, for example. But we will save that for uh, tomorrow. So let's skip to uh, this exercise uh, here. So mesh growth by subdivision and uh, avoiding self uh, collisions. So, So let me show you uh, a demo of what we're trying to do. So this exercise is bring together many of the concepts that we learned so far and put it in together in a big project. So you're gonna learn how to like make a like large project, not not that large, like relatively large with multiple file, multiple class, and we're gonna put everything in um, in a Visual Studio. We compile it as a plugin, okay, and then we will structure it in a way that make it both easier to access, not just as a normal Grasshopper plugin, but also access all of the feature using the c -sharp component and also using um, RM Python. So, um, <clears throat> so this is how it works. So we start with a triangular mesh, okay? Uh, maybe it's a bit difficult to see the triangle edge here. Okay, and um, we did similar thing the, um, yesterday with the sphere. So, so we attach sphere to polylines, and we push 
the uh, polylines out and you know as the uh, edge expand we will add more sphere in the center if the edge get too large here we do a similar thing with uh, mesh but it's, it's much more interesting uh, slightly more tricky because um, now the sphere part is identical the sphere relaxation part is identical okay however splitting the face when it get too large is slightly tricky but let me show you uh, how it, like what the outcome will be so again a sphere at each vertex let me run this real a uh, bit slow so per iterations okay um, so you see the thing like grow very quickly because exponential as you have more edge you know it you know the more edge you have the, the faster it, it will grow essentially okay so as the sphere being pushed out it will just find the nearest way it can go in order to avoid the other one so it doesn't go in a strange line if it know if it turn right it's like easier to avoid the other one so that's why you end up with a rather like weakly looking geometry okay because the sphere try to escape the nearest way possible from the other one and as they grow if if it edge if an edge is too large it will be so for example if it's iteration if this edge is longer than a certain threshold okay so Okay, so we want uh, the sphere to be up radius 1, okay, so the ideal distance is 2. However, as soon as they get to 1.9, so just before they get to the ideal non-overlapping distance, which is 1.9, we will split them. We will split this edge into 2, okay? So this edge will be split into 2, which means that this 2 face that flanks this edge will also be split into 4 edge in total. And then you end up with, like, more face and more edge. And and also means that a new sphere in the middle and this sphere will keep pushing further out and thing will grow, get longer and new sphere will popping up and whenever you have new sphere popping up it will push the other out and as the process of being popping out it, it will not puff pushing out in a straight line or a flat plane it will create this like a uh, weekly looking thing okay and if I let it run for a while uh, you will get a um, triangular mesh, uh, more or less, and um, I should let it run a bit more, but let me pause here. Um, it looks pretty rough because these are triangles, but but as a post-processing step, we can run it through the mesh subdivision smoothing uh, from WeaverBird. So if you have WeaverBird, uh, you can use this feature. If you don't, if I, you just like get this mesh, it's not very smooth, but you know you can still follow along and you can install WeaverBird uh, at some point later. Now, currently WeaverBird is being inactive, but if I increase the WeaverBird to uh, subdivision level to 2, so if you don't know what WeaverBird is, it's a plugin for Grasshopper that takes in a mesh and try to to divide a surface into smaller face so that it looks smoother. Now, this part does not affect our um, computation logic. Okay, This part is just a post-processing step so that we have a nicer display. Okay, But that, that is just for display only. It has, the, the entire logic is based on this original triangle, okay? But if I divide this, I will have a smoother display, okay? Much smoother. Okay, and now uh, if you happen to use uh, Rhino 6, you can, you, the, the preview in Rhino 6 is really nice. Um, so the preview now work in, so both the review is better because it can work in the render display mode. I turn on render and if I switch to render display mode you will see that some very nice uh, shading going on uh, so this is a variation okay so this is almost like render quality except that it's real time it's fully interactive okay so if you run this uh, you almost see like a, a, a real time version of like V-Ray <laughs> okay Okay, let's increase the number of vertices. Yeah? Is what? C sharp? <laughs> it's not there, what do you mean? Yeah, because it's a starting file, it's the zero, zero 005, right? Oh, the complete file, no, okay. Um, because we're gonna do it in Visual Studio. I I, I, I haven't given this version to the handouts yet. Okay, I, I should share it with you. So when I prototype this one, I write it in the c -sharp script component, but of course it's, it's a nightmare to write code in here this long, so we're gonna do it in Visual Studio, okay? Now the, the reason why I managed to do that is because I have my own trick <laughs> to make it um, 
easier to work with the script editor, but um, I, I will tell you uh, later. Anyway, um, let's water scroll a little bit. And um, let me tell you the features. Okay, so let me pause it. Even if you don't have a weaver bird, and if you just don't do any subdivision, and you get triangle, it still looks kind of okay. It looks uh, not too bad, actually. And the render mode is extremely suitable for this kind of geometry. So basically what the, render, um, the new render mode in Rhino 6 does is that it darkens the corner. So if you have a surface and it folds in, it's basically less light can get into this region, right? So it will be darkened. And this geometry, there's so many like kind of encavement that give that kind of lighting effect. So that's why it's so nice to um, visualize this kind of particular geometry uh, in Rhino 6. Now in Rhino 5, you also have the render mode, but it's not as nice uh, as Rhino 6. One, two, two thousand. Uh, I think we reached the maximum two thousand. Okay. So as we have more vertices, you will notice the thing. Um, so let me talk about all of the features that we're going to implement uh, today and tomorrow. So first, uh, the sphere. We're going to do the sphere uh, collision or pushing out at the subdivision. So um, hopefully within today. And but as the this thing get larger and larger, and you have more vertices, which means you have more sphere to cross compare with each other. It will get slower and slower. Um, so if I have 5,000, um, okay, let me do the slow version. So I turn off this optimization here. So the artery is something we learn tomorrow to make the collision faster. If I turn this off the, uh, the artery, it will use the slow version, which will a put forward version where we check every sphere with the other one. And this will get slow very quickly. So, okay, 45, it will, okay, slower and slower. Let's push this thing up a little bit. Okay, let, let me quickly put this on Google Drive. So, you know, if you want to crash your computer, you, you can too. Uh, um, this one gonna be uh, preview. Mescro system. Okay. Okay. Let me run this too. It's it's really slow. And then when I flip the switch on to to turn on the uh, optimization, you will see that the time go down, the execution time go down uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let me. Um, when it's reached almost 200, I will flip this on. Okay, let me uh, increase the, 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 the um, number of uh, total vertices. Okay, so it will grow more. Okay, so it's get really slow, right? So, but if I turn on this thing. Wait, hang on a second. Uh, Oh no, this is the wrong version of the file. Uh, let me see if I have that. Oh, this one is already the fast version. The slow version will be even slower. <laughs> the slow version will be even slower, but this one is already fast. So think about it. Here you currently have 10,000 sphere. For each sphere, you have to cross-check with other 99 sphere. So if you do the math, this is going to be how many zero, how, how many comparison you have, uh, that's gonna be 10 million comparison. So no wonder why it's kind of slow. So here is already pretty fast for 10,000, uh, 10 million uh, like collision. Um, anyway, so I, um, so, so that is something that we're gonna implement tomorrow, the, 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 the optimization. And then tomorrow we're gonna do the bending resistant. Okay, so what bending resistant does, so, if you look at the um, triangle version, the, the unsmooth version, so here there's no bending resistance. Is, uh, the bending resistance weight is zero, which means that we effectively turn it off. So bending resistance is basically it go to each pair of triangle and try to flatten it. Okay, so the sphere collision try to fold it and make it curve. But in real life, if you think of this as the uh, surface of a kale leaf, those surface of you know leaf or membrane, they have some sort of bending resistance. If you fold it, it try to spring back. 
and that does affect the final geometry because it's a confliction. So basically, the final geometry is some sort of a negotiation or, or a compromise between the force that try to fold them and try to bend them around each other so the surface does not intersect, and also the force that try to make them straight. Okay, and that does uh, affect the geometry uh, quite a bit. Okay, and I can show you in the slides here how much bending resistance. Okay, this is no bending resistance. Thing can fold like arbitrary. Okay, but if you have increased the the bending resistance, they will try to be as flat as possible, or you know, smooth as possible, and try to be less curved. Um, I have a bunch of experiments here. Um, this one has almost no bending resistance, so it will fold as much as possible, and then you end up with uh, something like almost like a uniform sphere because everything can freely fold so it become like a pretty uniform at the end of the day. Oh, I'm sorry, I, we start with a, a mesh uh, where the, the, the face, uh, the, uh, the upper face white and the bottom is red, you know, so but over time you see how the red and the white kind of nicely blend into each other naturally. Okay. Uh, now this one has slightly, uh, like significantly higher bending stiffness, and you will see that it folds less. You see how it's like smooth out more. Okay, and this one become more like a flower because it does not like fold crazily at every single pair of triangle. It's try to flatten out. And the final one has a very high uh, um, uh, bending resistance. This one, I also implement some shot of gravity that like kind of tend to bring the uh, everything down. So everything will not become a sphere overall because their gravity force to bring them out them down. So they will become a little bit like flattened on the ground. Okay, so this one you see a, like really long kind of petals here with like quite re relatively little. Um, folding or, or curving because the bending stiffness is like pretty high. The bending resistance is uh, pretty high. Okay, you can start with like some of the more interesting geometry. Um, for example, this one I start with a strip, uh, a strip of mesh rather than just, you know, uh, a four by four uh, simple mesh. Okay, and the thing is that no matter how complicated they are, they should supposed to be non-intersecting because of the sphere collision. So you, um, I, I will show you a 3D model, and then I will do some section plan, and you will see that they will, you know, let's say 98% uh, of the time will not intersect each other. Um, this is huh? This is no, this is like 100,000 vertices. So, uh, so it's actually not real time. Each, each frame might take up to like three seconds, but you know, it's just string crap rather than render, so it's still, uh, it's possible to record. Okay. Um, this one I start with a uh, classic Mobius strip. Okay, this one has only fifty thousand, I think, uh, fifty thousand vertices. So at first it's real time, like the first probably up until like ten thousand vertices is. Interactive. It's still like you can spin the viewport around uh, quite naturally. Okay. Now the final experimentation. This one, I only split the edge that at the border. Okay. So the surface only subdivide the edge at the border of the starting surface. So, so you get kind of quite different result. Okay, so only the one at the border can uh, subdivide. The, the one in the middle, uh, they cannot subdivide. They just wait for the other one to push them in or out. Okay. Uh, 
uh, there's also some gravity here, if I remember correctly, some gravity that keep them to be uh, like you know, close to the ground. Otherwise, you know, they might just like go up and uh, go up um, like almost indefinitely. Okay. Okay. Um, let me show uh, a three D model, and then I can um, do the clipping plan. Um, Rhino six clipping plan now work with Rhino uh, crossable geometry. You don't have to bake. I think you don't have to bake the geometry just to use the clipping uh, plan to see the sections. Uh, which one? Uh, this one, I st um, the starting mesh was closed. So this one doesn't have a back face because you know it, it's a closed uh, mesh. It's like a sphere, and we call it a sphere, so we only see the outer face. And uh, this is the result, I think. Okay, uh, again, some really nice uh, shadows at the uh, enclavement, at the uh, concave area. Okay, and compare this to the unrendered moss. I mean, this is like pretty boring looking. You cannot even like read the geometry properly, but it's just with some extra shadows, uh, you know, the geometry becomes so much like uh, clearer to to see. And now if I do uh, the clipping plan, okay. You see how it creates really intricate kind of enclavement, but non-intersecting. If you look at all of the section here, the curve itself, you know, they form island, but they never cross to each other, okay, because the sphere collision kind of ensure that. But you know, sometimes if the sphere is overpacked and they don't have enough time to get out from each other before the new one popping in, they might accidentally cross to each other. Okay, so I slide through the whole thing again, like almost no intersection, no sorry, with sections. And if you go in here, you can like, you, you can might think that the geometry stop here, but you actually rec uh, realize there's like an enclave inside. And if you go inside, it's actually, you know, there's a smaller enclave inside here. So it's pretty, you know, deep and intricate uh, kind of geometry, okay, in, in 3D space. Okay, so um, let's let get started. So, so we... we um, Before um, so let's talk about um, um, oh this one is too dark I think okay we, we we can jump to the code and I can fix the slide and we can discuss about the um, this part a bit later tomorrow but anyway so so if you look at the hands out um, make sure you copy the handouts to your local computer. Um, hands out. Um, day two. This is the Visual Studio Solution, uh, uh, the Mesh Growth Visual Studio Solution 00. So this is our starting point. So I will copy it to my desktop. Okay. And now let's open this solution. Okay. You can open Visual Studio Solution first and then open the, this folder or you can double click here. And inside here, there is the an SLN file. If you double click on that, it will open the entire solution folder inside Visual Studio, okay? And I will briefly explain what's going on inside. It's just some basic uh, starting code, so you don't have to do the boring declaration uh, all over again. Okay, so this is our solutions. Um, there's some source code file, um, but again, because you open this, this one was prepared on my computer, and then you open on your computer, some of the file is in the wrong location, like the, the Rhino and the Grasshopper um, library file are in the wrong uh, path. So if you expand the references uh, category, then very likely um, you will have you will have a little yellow dot on Grasshopper, on Rhino Common, 
on plankton and you know many other things. Okay, so we have to fix that manually. So for Rhino common, so how do you um, rechange the path? So if you right click on reference, okay, uh, if you go to browse. Okay, so right click on reference and say add reference, okay? And go to browse. This is where you can like rebrowse or rechange the path of the, those missing uh, reference. So for Rhino Commons, um, it's in the C drive. And add a Rhino 5, Rhino 6. And it's in system, okay? And you go to Rhino Common. Rhino common with capital R and capital C. Okay. Okay. The next one missing is grasshopper and grasshopper on version 6 is easy to find it's in C, in C drive and it's in the plugin folder so Rhino 6 a program file Rhino 6 plugins Grasshopper and Grasshopper.dll for those of you who Rhino 5 uh, it will be in a much uh, deeper place so raise your hand if you can't remember where it is I will help you because it's also kind of a bit different from each computer okay so and Rhino Common, the two Plankton files still missing, we're gonna fix it as well. So, uh, let me explain what Plankton is and why we need it. Um, um, so, we go into represent our growth system using mesh, right? And um, the the mesh data type. Ah, uh, let me quickly fix the color. Let's make it white. Okay. Okay. Why is it still that? But okay, it's not that bad. Anyway, if you have a mesh in Rhino, okay, so the Rhino uh, common library, it has a mesh class. And what is a mesh? Mesh is just a collection of triangular faces. So, so you can represent any geometry using triangular face, okay? Or, you know, polygonal face. The mesh in Rhino common support, support um, mesh that have either quad face with four vertices or triangular face, okay? So internally, uh, when you program mesh, if you look at the structure, if you have a mesh, if you look at the structure of how the mesh is represented programmatically, then you have a bunch of vertices, which is pawn 3D. These vertices is stored in a list, okay? And because they start in a list, they have an index number. So for example, this simple mesh, only three phase and, you know, uh, six vertices, okay? This is the vertices, okay? And the face is basically just, it's just a record of the index of the vertex, okay? So phase zero, it's just a record of index 2, 4, and 1. And they always go in the counterclockwise directions. Okay? So when you look at the mesh from the outside in, if you look at the, the vertex index, they always they can start from any vertices, but they have to go counterclockwise. Okay? So that is how you know programmatically uh, uh, you know in, in, in programming that the, that, uh, that that the mesh in Rhino Common is represented. Um, which is fine. So this representation is good for displaying mesh and doing simple operation to the mesh. However, if you want to do advanced stuff like 
removing phase or split a phase to to other those kind of operation is, is first very inconvenient to do with the default mesh in Rhino and also even if you manage how to do it it will get inefficient it be slow and actually it depends on if I'm not correctly I have to test it it depends on on the complexity of the mesh so the more vertex on the mesh you have splitting one phase will become more and more slower to run okay which is um, not good because as our mesh grow we you know we don't want to suffer from this extra penalty it's just the way that this mesh algorithm works it's very simple to store a mesh and display it on the screen but if you want to do live editing as, as we are going to do in the grow mesh system this is not uh, ideal so this is why there are extra um, mesh library for um, uh, for Grasshopper, um, so if you use a plugin like Weaverbird that also deal with mesh, they end up implement their own mesh system inside to do the subdivision. Okay, so you give them a Rhino mesh, they convert it to their own like mesh representation using a different techniques, and at the end of the day, they they convert it back to to Rhino so that you have something uh, to work in a normal Rhino. Uh, in Kangaroo One, um, Kangaroo One also come with this a uh, custom mesh library called Plankton Mesh, which we are going to use. So I'm gonna describe briefly the difference between plankton mesh and rhino mesh. So, okay, actually I can't go too much into the, the detail now because we're gonna set up the code. But uh, the, the the key takeaway message is that um, the way that the mesh is represented in uh, in plankton is a bit more sophisticated. It it's not immediately obvious why it's better, but the key takeaway message is that it makes splitting phase extremely extremely efficient and easily no matter how many vertices you have in your mesh the time it takes to split one phase is always the same okay but if you use random mesh if i'm not mistaken the more vertices the more complex your mesh is then the more expensive it will be just to split one phase okay so that's why it's important so and because like mesh and mesh splitting is a pretty um uh, common technique in computational design these days it I think it's kind of nice to take this uh, this chance to introduce you to Plankton Mesh. Okay, so Plankton Mesh is an um, open source library. Um, most people use it uh, as with Kangaroo One. They didn't even know that it it, it came with Kangaroo One because you know it uh, Kangaroo One use it internally to to do some mesh subdivisions and mesh management. Um, but because it's open source, so you can use it like independent from kangaroo one as well here in our case we use to split the mesh efficiently so uh without we're not going into the actual details of how plankton mesh work yet okay we just set up the file so plankton mesh it comes with kangaroo one however that version doesn't come with the documentation so when you type in the code in visual studio you notice that when you open the bracket a little tooltip will pop up and explain what the function does what each parameter means that documentation doesn't come with plankton uh, with the plankton file in in kangaroo one so that's why i go to the github i go to the source code and i rebuild i, I rebuild the source code from scratch to get those um those documentations so and in the hands out i already give it out to you so let's install plankton mesh to our grasshopper system and then we're gonna use we're gonna add that extra plankton library to our visual studio as well okay so if you go to hands out Day two and go to plankton mesh. I uh, so this is the plankton library that I compiled from the source code I got and I compiled it. Of, of, uh, I make two separate uh, uh, build or compilation. Uh, so it depends on which version of Rhino you are using. You should uh, go to the right folder. So Rhino six or Rhino five. Uh, you copy the whole thing, everything except the init file, just the plankton file. Okay, and you will notice the important here is the XML file. The XML file is where the tune tips and the extra documentation is contained. So when you code in Visual Studio, you can see the documentation of each functions nicely. Okay, so copy everything and move it to the libraries folder of um, your Grasshopper plugin. Okay, just copy and paste everything here. I already have it, so.
Okay, so now the plankton uh, is in Grasshopper, so it's you know, ready to use by Grasshopper. Now we just need to refer to it, like to tell Visual Studio that the file is right here, so Visual Studio can can access all of the C sharp function that was defined inside Plankton. So Plankton was original written in C sharp, uh, by the way, and the source code is on uh, GitHub uh, website. So if you could go for GitHub Plankton, you will see the entire source code. But um, we don't need to know the source code. Um, okay, we we. we you know, in order to use a library, you don't know. You need to know the entire source code, or like internally how the, the library works. Okay, let's go back to our Visual Studio solutions. And on your computer, the Plankton file and the Plankton GH file are being missing. Okay, so they have a yellow dot. Okay, so we just need to correct the path again. Okay, so go to Add Reference. Okay, right click on Reference. All right, right click on Reference. Uh, add Reference and browse, okay, and just browse to the library folder, okay, and point them to plankton dol and plankton gh dol, okay, add them in, and they should appear here. Yeah. If you have problem figuring out this step, just let us know. Okay, so um, let's have a quick look at the code. Uh, okay, so we have two um, source code files with almost nothing. Uh, the first is the MeshGrove system class, okay? Uh, this class lives inside the namespace MeshGrove. Again, I haven't explained what the namespace is yet, but for now we just like use the same namespace for every source code file, which is MeshGrove for now. Now inside there's some code that I comment out. We're gonna later activate this code, okay? Uh, this, this class this currently is empty, it doesn't contain anything yet. But this class will basically store everything related to our system. Now the reason why we don't write all of this functionality in this code directly in the Grasshopper component code is because by package it into a class, we can reuse it easily, uh, even outside of that Grasshopper component. We can reuse this thing using RM Python or using like the C subscript component. Okay, we're gonna write a code in there. Now uh, go to. If you go to the other um, C sharp file, which is called GSC MeshGrow, so this is the Grasshopper component where where we're gonna bring the feature of the MeshGrow class to to the main Grasshopper user. Okay. Now look at the code. So what do we have here? Uh, okay, this is the constructor with the basic naming. Okay, nothing surprise. I condense it. Uh, and here's just a bunch of input parameters. Uh, the meaning will be explained uh, a little bit later, but it's just a standard um, routine that we have been doing for the entire day, uh, where we just declare the input and then just read in the input, okay? And so far, nothing else. We just read in the input, uh, but we haven't done anything with them yet, okay? But this thing should be pretty standard and frankly quite boring, so I just put them there for you to begin with. Okay, there's no icon. You, you, you can do the icon tomorrow as well. Anyway, so this is the class with the basic functions that we have been working with for the entire day, you know, so instant. Okay, the extra thing we have is the MeshGrow system, which we mark as private. So remember when we do the moving point, we need to declare the current position of the point as a global position. We, we cannot declare the point inside the solve instant because that point will be destroyed as soon as, it, that point will be destroyed after each run of the component, we want that point to live on, right? So the Mescro system will basically store the current position of all of the vertices, all right, 
at, at every iteration, we're gonna push them out. And in the next iteration, we want to look at the current position and push them out even more. We don't want to like create a brand new system from scratch every time, okay? Similar to how we do the moving particle. So that's why we have to declare it at the global scope so that they are, so, so this, this um, system is persistent. Okay, so this is a macro system variable and currently it's, this class is empty. There's no features inside yet, okay? Okay, so, but let's quickly build it to see if we get any error message, okay? So build it and if all the reference is correct, you should, okay, there's still one error on, on you. It says build success, but the copy will not be successful because the path, the, um, the path that it's supposed to copy to is, hasn't been modified yet. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's do one extra step uh, where, remember, um, we have to change the path where the GHA file is copied to. So uh, let's go to properties, uh, go to post build events, and the path is going to be different from each computer, but most of the time it will look something like this. So the first line going to be this one. Let me. Basically, it's just different in, in the name, really. Uh, so my, the path is, has the word my name long in it, but in your case, probably your username. Okay, so please fix that one. <coughs> and the final name should be um, mescrow.gha. So let's hard code in the name mescrow. Yep. Okay, after you fix that, let's build and start Grasshopper to see if the Mescro component appear in, in Grasshopper. Yeah. So we are, um, rem if you remember, so remember, we um, changed the, the, the copy path so that the GHA file is automatically copied to, to the libraries folder. So you change the target uh, path to to basically this one, uh, to to this folder, special folder, component folder, the library. Okay, so this is where the, uh, the plugin is supposed to reside. Uh, copy it, okay. Go to Visual Studio. It's quite small here. Uh, so we're gonna do the entire quotation mark right here, paste it here, and s terminate with meshgrove.gha. Okay, so that is the target location for the file. So let me copy these two lines in a larger text editor. Okay, so your path should look similar, except that instead of long, my, my name, uh, you should have usually your name there. So if we compile successfully, um, let's open it in Grasshopper to see that it actually appears. Okay, this component should appear in the uh, category workshop as well. And you have, or uh, if you just search for mesh growth, hmm, it's not here yet.
Okay, we have mesh growth here. Okay, so if it has appeared, then you're fine. All right, let's set this up. Uh, the I prepare an empty file with a bunch of input parameters for you. So if you open handout, um, go to grasshopper file, mesh growth, and choosing the starting file. Uh, okay. Uh, so a bunch of parameters. So you now we play the mesh growth in here and hook them up. Okay, they will not do anything because it's just read in the parameters and do nothing. But we set this up and save it. So next time we change the code, we don't have to set this up again. So reset. Go here. Starting mesh sub iterations. In the grasshopper file, in the hands out, this one day two grasshopper file. Okay, if you don't have a uh, weaver bird, this thing is missing, but it's still fine. You can install it uh, another day. All right, after you set it up, uh, save it, um, because we're going to use it uh, from now on. So you don't have to set it up again. Okay, uh, also don't forget to hook up the timer. Okay, let's make sure that everybody gets into this stage, okay? And then tomorrow we'll uh, Okay, just wanted to say to those of you guys watching on the live stream, uh, thank you very much for attending. So it's the end of today. Uh, so if you set this up everything as on the projector, then um, you can call it to the, uh, the end of today. And uh, tomorrow we're going to actually uh, implement the logic of the mesh growth, okay? So, okay, hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.